Good afternoon and welcome to the primary source webinar on children's human rights, an issue for global action. We're joined today by Professor Warren Binford from Willamette University. Uh, this webinar is the final webinar in our three-part global social justice series. We owe a special thank you to the Cummings Foundation for their support of this webinar series. And a special welcome to teachers participating in this webinar from Medford, Somerville, and Woburn Public Schools in Massachusetts as part of our Cummings grant to support global and cultural competency work in these districts. Our Global Social Justice series has allowed us to really delve deep into important topics. If you missed the first two, you can find our webinars on climate social justice and gender violence on the Primary Source YouTube page and on the resource guide that I'll introduce towards the end of today's program. You'll actually see a link, a URL to that in the chat box here. For those of you joining Primary Source uh, for a webinar for the first time, Primary Source is a nonprofit organization in Boston that advances global education in schools through creating global learning opportunities for K-12 teachers in the form of professional development. We do that work through face-to-face -face and online courses and programs, such as this webinar, curricular resources in our library and on our website, and international study tours. My name is Anne-Marie Gleason, and I'm a program director here at Primary Source. I'm joined today by my colleague Susan Zeiger to host today's session. Just to give you a sense of how we'll proceed, um, after a brief introduction, Professor Binford will give her talk. We'll take any questions that you have about our talk in children's rights. And then I'll introduce a few teaching resources that are available to support addressing this topic in your classroom and schools. You should see a chat box in the left-hand column of your screen. Please type in questions and comments that you have throughout Professor Binford's talk, and we will ask those questions during the Q&A. Also, during the Q&A, if you have a question that you would like to ask using um, your microphone or phone, you can raise your hand in the participant window. Um, in the participant window, you'll see a few little icons. One is a hand icon. And if you raise that, then we can open your mic for you during the Q&A part, and you can ask your question live in person. Otherwise, um, please feel free to type in any comments and questions throughout today's presentation in the chat box. I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our speaker for today's program, Professor Warren Benford. Professor Binford is an associate professor at Willamette University College of Law and the director of Willamette's clinical law program in Oregon. She is also the inaugural Fulbright uh, Canada Telex Foundation Distinguished Visiting Chair in Brain Science and Child and Family Health and Wellness um, at the University of Calgary. Um, in 2000 and, um, 2012, Professor Binford was selected as a Fulbright Scholar and spent six months in South Africa lecturing and researching children's issues and the advancements of children's rights in Africa. Throughout her work, she has collaborated with numerous child rights scholars, advocates, and NGOs, including the Child Rights Project, Save the Children, UNICEF, and the Red Cross. She teaches on international children's rights. Um, and as a career-long child advocate, she's also spent some time as a teacher as well. So I can't think of a better expert to discuss children's rights today with us uh, than Warren Benford. So thank you, Professor Benford, for joining us. And I'll now turn over okay, the microphone great. to you. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, if you could just again turn oh. up your microphone just a little bit. So is that better? OK, great. Yes. So um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for participating today. I, as Anne-Marie explained, started out uh, right after college as an inner city teacher. I taught in South Central Los Angeles. I, I taught seventh, eighth, uh, and ninth grade. And then I went to Chelsea, Massachusetts, and uh, taught first grade while I did my master's in education. And, uh, I, and then after that, I went to London and taught in inner city London. And it was through those experiences of being in the classroom that I realized how much work there was to be accomplished in the world. And so I initially uh, went to law school to try and impact education changes for children because I saw such discrepancies in the educational experiences of um, you know, the wealthy children versus the inner city kids that I was working with. And that led to me discovering more and more about all of the challenges that children are facing around the world. And so since then, I've devoted my um, professional efforts to trying to make an impact on the advancement of children's rights around the world. So when we talk about children's rights, what are we really talking about? And what we're talking about here is that uh, in, in, in the last 500 years, but especially in the last 100 years, there have been 
an international legal framework that has developed that recognizes that all of us as human beings have uh, inherent human rights. And, you know, this really started with the Magna Carta. You see it in the uh, U.S. Constitution and, you know, Francis, the rights of man. And basically in the 20th century, we started to develop international treaties around the world that focus on human rights. And we began to understand that children not only enjoy human rights that are inherent to all of us, with just a few exceptions, certain you know rights with regard to the right to marriage, et cetera, but that in addition to the inherent human rights that all children have uh, by virtue of their humanity, they also have certain rights that are unique to their status of children. And uh, these, these include, for example, they have special rights in, in instances of armed conflict or wars. We see that children have special rights uh, against exploitation that are higher than the rights and protections that adults have. They have right to education, et cetera. And so at this point, we have a pretty large and well-defined body of children's rights that have been developed internationally and are, are recognized by virtually every country in the world. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of, of international children's rights and, and how that developed. Once again, we hear the story of a school teacher. And in this case, the school teacher was Eglantine Jeb. And she was, she was born in the late uh, 19th century uh, in England. And she was Oxford educated. And uh, she started teaching in the uh, inner city schools in London. And she too was quite horrified with what, what she was seeing there. And she became involved in some war efforts. And in particular, she started to do some refugee relief work uh, during the Balkans War. And when she went there, at the time, what people, what countries at war did was they viewed the children of their enemies as enemies as well. And what Eglantine Jeb said is that, no, children are not our enemies. And, and she tried to encourage people to view children, all children who are impacted by war, as victims of that war. And so she then went to Geneva and started working with the League of Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross that at that point were starting to grow and providing relief to victims of war, both adult and children, and started to try and encourage people to recognize that the children were not just little adults and that they weren't inherently evil like their parents are, or, you know, which was the way that people were viewing their enemies of war, but that, that these are, are, are young victims of war and needed protection. And so she, as part of that effort, founded Save the Children, which still exists today and provides relief for children in all different sites types of situations around the world. And she was seen as, as a woman on fire. And I don't know if you saw on the last slide um, that she, she lived a relatively short life. And some people thought that one of the reasons why she lived such a short life is because she was so tireless in her efforts that she finally burned herself out. And she was said to, she was referred to as the white flame. And after she died, you know, they said that she was a woman on fire. And she was frequently sick and exhausted because of her tireless efforts on behalf of uh, child victims of war and then the development of uh, international children's rights. So what, what Eglantine Jeb did is she was feeling exhausted by what she was witnessing on the front lines of the war, both in the Balkans and then after World War I. And she climbed to the top of Mount Celeb, which is a, a mountain overlooking Gene Geneva. And she sketched out what became the first international instrument outlining children's rights, specifically as different than human rights, children's rights. And this was uh, endorsed unanimously by the League of Nations in 1924. And basically, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child said that we owe our children, children all around the world, our very best and that we needed to provide for children's physical and material and spiritual development. When they were hungry, we needed to feed them. When they were sick, we needed to care for them. We needed to teach them right and wrong. We need to make sure that they receive the shelter and the care that they need. That when children are harmed in, in times of distress, such as war or um, natural disasters, they need to be the ones who are, are first helped. And I want you to think about that for a second because that actually changes in the next international instrument. That you know how when you're on airplanes they say that 
you uh, need to put on your own mask first before you put on the mask of the child who's traveling with you. Um, that uh, basically in the next international child rights instrument that we're going to look at, that's what they did. That they said, you know, actually we need to take care of the doctors and the caregivers and the nurses first, and then they can help. The, the children. Um, but uh, when Englantine Jeb drafted the Declaration of the Rights of the Child that was adopted in 1924, they said children must be given priority when, when we're trying to provide relief to uh, communities in crisis. It also said that children need to be prepared to earn a livelihood, that we needed to prepare them for a, a life of uh, work and of service, and that we needed to make sure that they were not exploited. And something that was interesting is, is that it was very clear in this first declaration that children needed to be uh, taught the value of service to, to one another. So that was a very, very popular international instrument, and it was quite groundbreaking um, with regard to viewing children as different. different. But of course, even after the Declaration on the Rights of the Child was um, was adopted, and after World War One had you know brought nations together and said that they never were going to fight each other again, we then had World War Two, and uh, of course, World War Two led to more suffering of children, and it also led to the dissolution of the League of Nations afterwards and the formation of the United Nations. And so, the Declaration on the Rights of the Child that was drafted in 1924 was no longer uh, in power. Now, this uh, was no longer, you know, recognized by a, a continuing organization. And so basically what happened was the United Nations leaders said, you know, we need to have a treaty, not just an in instrument, not just a declaration on children's rights, but we need to actually have a treaty where people are bound to uh, follow those children's rights and respect children's rights and not just be inspired by the international instrument. And so they tried to do that, and not surprisingly, because as we know, all political bodies are inherently political, they could not agree on an enforceable treaty in order to uh, ensure that, that there was international agreement on children's rights. And so once again, instead of having a treaty on children's rights, which is where everybody who signs it is obligated to follow it, they spent 13 years to bring together an international uh, another international declaration, and they used as the core of that 1959 declaration, uh, the 1924 declaration that had been drafted by our school teacher Eglin Kind Jeb, um, and basically this was drafted by you know major governments from around the world. The U.S. participated actively in it, um, but once again, it was not binding, uh, and but it was it was passed by the General Assembly and. And this was more developed than the 1924 declaration. This had both a preamble and ten principles building out from the 1924 declaration. And they didn't just try and inspire the individuals around the world to give children the very best that we have, but they shifted duties to voluntary organizations and local authorities, but again, not finding on, on the nations themselves. So, in the 1959 declaration, children clearly had a right to a name and nationality, adequate nutrition, housing, play and recreation, medical services, and education. Name and nationality has become very important uh, to us today because what we're seeing is a lot of trafficking with children. We're seeing a lot of uh, instability around the world through through wars and through poverty and um, and so what we're, we're seeing is uh, a higher refugee population than we've ever witnessed before. And children whose names and nationalities are not established are especially, especially vulnerable to not being accepted into communities and being exploited. So we're seeing a higher rate of exploitation. For example, in China, there was for decades a one-child policy that under certain circumstances allowed you to have two or three children, um, but it was often up to local authorities to decide if you could only have one child. And if you had another child, uh, in addition to that one child that was government recognized, those children often were not given any official recognition that they were born without birth certificates and they um, have been much more susceptible to trafficking in Asia, both sex trafficking and, and labor trafficking in Asia than what we're seeing with the children who have birth certificates. We're also seeing this problem a lot in Africa, where there are a lot of children who do not have their name and nationality 
documented and uh, in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa in particular, we're seeing a lot of children who do not have registered births who are uh, susceptible to exploitation, both through labor and, and sexual exploitation. So a new concept that hadn't been talked about in the 1924 declaration, but really important and relevant, um, especially today. And then in addition to that, um, you know, there was a new uh, attention that was paid to something that I think that a lot of you experience in your classrooms, which is the importance of giving special or adapted attention to children who have special needs, as, as well as children who don't have uh, immediate families who are available. And um, and so trying to provide for children who are trying to survive without family, another population that we see a lot in refugee camps today in refugee communities. So then after the, the 1959 declaration, another 20 years passed. And in 1979, which was the year of the child, children's rights advocates came together again and they said, we really need a treaty. We really need to have a convention that is binding on the uh, on the community, uh, the international global community. And so what they said is that let's sit down and commit to drafting a treaty that's based upon children's rights. And basically, they spent the next 10 years, from 1979 to 1989, drafting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most widely ratified treaty in the history of the world. Every single country in the world had ratified it as of three years ago. And three years ago, the only countries that had not ratified it were the United States, South Sudan, and Somalia. And as you know, the reason why South Sudan had not ratified it is because it only became a state four years ago. And so you had a situation where you had a brand new country that was finally recognized. And one of their top priorities in the first few years that they were a country was the ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And they, in fact, have now ratified it. You also understand that Somalia, from the early 1990s, had no functioning government. So they had no way to ratify it um, shortly after it came into force in 1990. And so they also couldn't ratify it. But of course, a couple of years ago, they finally were able to establish a, a legitimate government, still unstable, but at least it's somewhat functioning. And so they too have ratified it. So today, we now are the only country in the history of the world that has not ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what's really surprising about this refusal to ratify is that the U.S. contributed more language to the in the drafting process of the Convention on the Rights of the Child than any other participating country. We also submitted more comments and revisions to the convention than any other country, and that we signed it, which indicates an intent to ratify it. But when it actually got to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it has sat there ever since. So it's been basically you know, 20 years approximately since it's, it's been sitting before the committee. And, um, and there is no um, strong promise of ratification anytime in, in the near future. Um, I think that you all have probably been watching what's going on in Congress, and we don't have a high-functioning high Congress right now, and that's impacting uh, our international obligations and our international uh, activities with regard to ratification. Although I, I will say, I looked at the Foreign Relations Committee um, activity a, a couple of months ago, and I did notice that they were ratifying economic-related uh, treaties, um, you know, such as those that, those that had to do with banking and imports and things like that. So they're, they're still functioning when it comes to uh, financial concerns, but, but don't seem to be very concerned with, with children's rights right now and moving this forward. Um, in, in any event, um, the fact that the U.S. is the outlier doesn't diminish the fact that this Children's Convention broke records by, by gaining the greatest number of signatories. On the day it opened for signature, it's garnered more ratifications than any other human rights treaty ever, and it's been implemented more quickly than any other human rights treaty ever. And so you have a strong level of support for it all around the world. Now, the UN Children's Convention um, is meant to set standards for how do we provide for children. It is not an enforcement uh, treaty. In other words, it's a reporting treaty, which means that the countries who sign on to the CRC are supposed to monitor their progress in, in um, keeping true 
to the ideals that are outlined in the treaty and making sure that they are complying with the treaty provisions. But if they don't, there's no stick. You know, there, there's a certain amount of pressure that can be put on them by uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and say, hey, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, and that's a little bit of public humiliation, um, you know, but it's not like there are any real sanctions that are allowed. And so basically what happens is every five years, the parties to the treaty submit a periodic report, and they report on every provision of the treaty and how they're doing in making progress with regard to children's educational rights, with regard to name and nationality rights, with regard to children's uh, political rights, etc. cetera. Um, and this, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is even, you know, far more robust than the 1959 Declaration in that it, it's suddenly gone up from 10 articles to 41 substantive articles and the preamble, and then there are 13 additional uh, sections or articles that explain what the procedure is for filing the periodic reports and, you know, how countries, states, parties are supposed to be implementing the UN Children's Convention. So basically, the Convention on the Rights of Child uh, is comprised of three basic areas of, uh, you know, conceptual areas. The first one, we call these the three Ps, and the first one is called provision that children need to be provided with certain things, that they need to be given a name, they need to be given a nationality, they need to be provided with health care, and they need to be provided with an education. The next area is with regard to protection, that children have heightened vulnerability, and that we need to make sure that they're not being exploited, that they're not being caught up in the criminal justice system uh, or detained for any other reason by, you know, anybody or by including the government and that they uh, should not be removed from parental care unless there is a uh, significant risk to their health and well-being. And then the third area is really about raising active and engaged citizens in our society. So this is participation. And basically what we say in the UN Convention is that children should be able to participate at a developmentally appropriate level in the decisions that affect them. So that, for example, we'll talk a little bit more about refugees later on in, in this webinar, um, but what, what we are seeing, for example, is in the United States, when a uh, child is a refugee here in the United States and they're not in the care of an adult, such as a parent or another family member who can advocate for them, they uh, are, are left to fend for themselves in the justice system, and there is not a system that, uh, that allows them to be legally represented um, by someone who is paid by the government. So they're not allowed a government lawyer, basically, to advocate them or, or anyone who's directly funded by the government. And so we have these children who don't understand the processes that they're a part of, and they don't have a way to express themselves and tell their story in such a way that might allow them to stay in the United States because they meet certain standards for refugees being allowed to stay in the United States. But under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, they are entitled to participate in those types of decisions and tell people what their experiences are and what they want and why they want it. And then they also, um, under the convention, are uh, allowed the rights to participation in all community systems that affect the child's life and then to participate in their selection of religion and things like that so that they, they, there's ethical integrity in the things that they believe in the development of, of their beliefs. So after the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, there were three optional protocols, and these are kind of supplemental treaties that are made to enhance the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the, as you figured out, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a huge treaty. It's huge with regard to its length and its comprehensiveness and the number of countries that are parties to it. But what we, we have is some disagreement during the drafting process about the treaty not going far enough. And so there were lots of compromises that were made in the drafting process, and people didn't agree, for example, with regard to ages and certain protections that, that needed to be given. And so after the UN Children's Convention was drafted and adopted by so many different uh, by so many different countries, different states parties came together and child rights advocates came together and they said, you know what, we need to have some mini treaties that complement the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and focus on specific areas where we're seeing children encounter a lot of problems. So in the, in the mid-1990s, I uh, had the 
blessing, the opportunity to go to Geneva and work with the International Red Cross in identifying protections for children in war and trying to figure out where the gaps are in the system. And eventually, there was an optional protocol that was developed to the CRC, and it, it has heightened protections for children who are victims of armed conflict. So these might be refugee children, these might be child soldiers, and how it basically outlines how we need to treat them and how we need to give them greater protections than we have historically as a global community. In addition to that, in the late 20th century, we became, as a global community, much more aware of the sexual exploitation of children. And we started to understand that children were being trafficked, that children were being prostituted, and the, we saw a huge rise in the area of child pornography. Um, and we're continuing to see that rise t today, you know, with the uh, widespread availability of smartphones and the ability to, you know, we document everything that we do, or, you know, the food that we eat and where we go and, and who or with whom we are um, going to events and stuff. And we're seeing the same thing with the child sexual abuse, um, which is that people are documenting the child sex abuse and child pornography is widespread. And the victims of child pornography are saying that this is a, a very devastating experience to have their sex abuse imagery being distributed out there. So there was a movement to also have an optional protocol that focuses on these things, child trafficking, child prostitution, and child pornography, and recognizes the heightened protections that victims of these crimes have who are children. And then the last one is actually fairly recent. And this came, uh, this optional protocol to the CRC on a communications procedure basically had to do with the fact that there was no enforcement mechanism for the original uh, convention. And there were many advocates who said there's no way for individual children to appear before the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. There's no way for individual children to bring complaints uh, when countries violate their rights before the UN Committee. And there is uh, insufficient opportunity for NGOs and other nonprofits to advocate on behalf of children. And so uh, they added another optional protocol, which basically uh, provides a procedure by which individual children and NGOs representing them and their interests can also appear before the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and try and bring complaints about uh, nations' violations of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the first two protocols, the first optional protocol with regard to children in armed conflict and the second optional protocol with regard to uh, child sex abuse, hugely popular optional protocols, uh, which probably isn't surprising to you. Everybody cares about children who are harmed by war, and everybody cares about children who are being sexually exploited. Fewer countries seem to care about being held accountable for individual children, you know, two individual children whose rights are being violated. So although there were, there were enough, um, there have been enough states parties to this protocol, this treaty, to, uh, you know, make it effective, there have not been uh, nearly as many signatories and parties to this treaty as we saw with the other two optional protocols that predated it. But not really surprising, and the number is growing slowly. Those countries who agree to be a state's party to the CRC, that this can be enforced against them, but any country that is a party to the CRC but has not ratified the option of protocol on the communications procedure, they can't be held accountable by individual children for violations of their rights. Now, in addition to these UN conventions, um, there have been some other specific uh, declarations and, and treaties or conventions to do with certain areas that are affecting children more and more as we become more of a global community. Um, one has to do with the welfare of children, which focuses on adoption and foster children. Um, the other one has to do with international child abduction. Um, there, we've, we're seeing with more and more uh, international marriages, we're seeing more and more international divorces. And what we're seeing as a result of this is that when there's a custody dispute between parents who have citizenship in other countries, it is becoming more and more common for parents to remove their child to their home country um, when the marriage starts to break down. And I actually am on the list of attorneys with the U.S. State Department doing uh, representation of left-behind parents here in Oregon when their children are, are kidnapped and either brought to Oregon or when their children are taken elsewhere and the parent here needs help. So 
a lot of work being done in this area. And then there's also another Hague Convention, which has to do with intercountry adoption. We all have seen like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie and the wonderful large family that they've developed and many other families that are adopting uh, internationally, uh, almost always for, for very admirable reasons, but with so much money going back and forth uh, with regard to international adoption, uh, it has made a lot of children and a lot of families very vulnerable to trafficking for adoption purposes. And of course, some children who are adopted internationally are uh, being adopted for um, you know, exploitative purposes, including sexual abuse. And so the Hague Convention was developed to try and set up a system by which that could be international adoption could be more closely regulated. And then the, um, the, the next Hague Convention that I write about here has to do with really, you know, uh, the responsibilities of parents in international families to uh, continue to provide for their children through child support and things like that and, and the ways in which uh, families that have a breakdown uh, in an international marriage can still enjoy, you know, a resolution of custody matters and, and child support matters that are beneficial to the children who are impacted. Now, in addition to these area-specific treaties, what we also have seen is a rise in regional instruments. So once again, you know, the Convention on the Rights of the Child involves so many different countries trying to address so many different issues that not everybody was happy. And so regional communities around the world were also welcome to develop their own treaties amongst themselves that related to children's rights. And so we've seen regional instruments being developed in Africa and Europe, South, South Asia, and also in the Arab countries. And all of these differ in a variety of ways from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So that, you know, for example, if there are uh, certain African customs that are very important to those, those countries or those communities, for example, with regard to a child's obligations to the family and to the community, that are written into the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child that you don't see in the, in the UN Convention. And so regions have tried to develop uh, additional treaties that normally have even higher standards than the UN Convention in order to provide even uh, recognition of even greater rights or unique rights that their children might have culturally in that area. And then um, you know, the question always is, okay, so we've had almost 100 years now of developing all these wonderful in international instruments that recognize children's rights, but is it really making a difference? And if you take a look at the state of the world's children, it can be somewhat discouraging at times, you know, that we have over 2 billion children in the world, and, you know, one of the, the great um, privileges and one of the great burdens about doing the work that I do is that, you know, I've been to over 80 countries at this point. I've met children all over the world. You know, I've, I've been to shanty towns and I've been to villages and I've been to the inner cities. And, oh, my goodness, you know, the number of children that we see suffering around the world um, can really be heartbreaking. And, you know, basically we're living in a world where half the children, almost half the children worldwide, are impoverished. And there's a tremendous economic equality inequality uh, in the world, and even in the United States at this point, I think the most recent statistic I saw on poverty in the United States was about about 23% of children in the United States are living in poverty. So here we are, you know, one of the richest countries in the world, but we have um, a tremendous amount of inequality, um, and we have, I think, the highest I, I, I read recently, um, I think it's the highest in the developed world, or if not the highest, one of the highest. Um, levels of inequality in the developed world. And um, and what happens is, is that when you see that level of uh, inequality and the, that level of poverty, it really makes children vulnerable to exploitation in areas like trafficking and child labor uh, and, um, you know, both labor trafficking and sex trafficking um, as parents try, and also the adoption trafficking, you know, as parents try to keep food on the, on the table for their kids and children go out to work because parents die. I mean, you see a lot of children in Africa whose parents have died from, from AIDS or from lack of health care and stuff and the children are often the providers for their younger siblings. So um, this poverty really creates a, a tremendous vulnerability for our, our young people. Um, at the same time, it's really important to realize that we are making progress in certain areas. So that, you know, for example, the child mortality rate uh, around the world used to be about 1 in 10, 
and, and now it's approximately 1 in 20. And so we do see us making progress with advancing, you know, the, the at least survival rates of, of children in early childhood at a rate that, that we did not see historically. Um, you know, but we're still seeing a tremendous number of uh, children who are Ill illiterate. And of course, uh, illiteracy can create uh, vulnerabilities to exploitation and to um, having them disenfranchised from the political system, obviously from the educational system, and some of the issues that we talked about earlier, such as, you know, not having an officially recognized name and nationality, you know, being subjected to poverty, that these often can also contribute to uh, girl children being excluded from the education uh, system, in addition to just the tremendous amount of sexism that we see around the world with regard to girl children. And it's interesting because some of the research that I was looking at last year really focused on where can you make the most impact as far as uh, providing economic advancement for a family. And what we found in that research is that having a highly educated mother um, is the greatest determinant of uh, both the economic stability of the family and the uh, advancement of the children. And so if we really want to try and break the cycle of poverty, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that not only our boy children around the world are, are receiving a, a high level of education, but that our girl children are as well. So focusing specifically on, on, on refugee children, so um, I have had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to visit some refugee camps and to learn about the refugee child experience uh, in different parts of the world. And in particular, I have done some work around uh, the need for representation, for legal representation of what are called unaccompanied children. So children who are separated by their parents at some point and are in a foreign country and, and need to navigate the legal system to try and gain legal protection. Um, what we're seeing right now is that there are about 10 million refugee children worldwide and that, um, you know, we all have been seeing a lot of imagery, uh, imagery and uh, stories, news stories coming out of Syria right now. And there are currently 3 million children that have been displaced by the conflict that's going on there. And, uh, and it's really important to recognize that these children experience tremendous instability and violence at a very vulnerable point in, in their lives during their formative years, and that these children have the same rights as all other children under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as the uh, additional optional protocols and other treaties that have been formed recognizing their rights. But in addition to that, they have a right to to recovery and to be reintegrated into their communities, um, you know, if, if their status is due to armed conflict. Um, and it's as teachers, I want to make sure that, you know, we all are sensitive to the fact that one of the main areas where children experience, refugee children experience some of the greatest, uh, you know, harm is through instability in their education while they are in refugee camps. I have a law student this, this semester who just did his, uh, so he'd already done his JD in law and he just finished his LLM um, here at Willamette. And he spent five years in, re in refugee camps as, as a child. And, you know, there is so much instability that, that happens in those camps and their lives are really, if they're lucky enough to get into a camp, you know, that they're often put on hold there for years. And some children spend the better part of their childhood in these refugee camps where there's not necessarily easy access to, you know, sanitary water or recreation and, and you know, healthy food and stuff, but they um, they survive. They try to survive. And education is an area where we're, we promised them free and compulsory education under the UN Convention, that we're supposed to be providing equal access to public schools, that we're supposed to be accommodating the special needs, we're supposed to be providing technical and vocational education, and we're supposed to be providing education that is consistent with the child's values and morals and, and their religion. And that's really, really hard to do when you have an unstable population that is moving or is in one temporary place where they're living in tents, which is what happens in a lot of the refugee camps. Um, another area that's, that's worth thinking about is with regard to child labor. So um, I had, um, you know, the experience of going to Asia and researching child labor there, and I spent some time um, both in Thailand looking at child sex workers and also in uh, Nepal and looked at both children who were working in, you know, rug factories as well as children who were working in the um, 
in, in the uh, tourist industry. And, you know, it just absolutely broke my heart because the first day that I landed in Thailand, I like massages just like the rest of you. And I, you know, had heard about Thai massages. And so I went to a massage parlor that was not in the sex district. And I was led into this little room with a curtain, and immediately this little girl came in to massage me. And I was like, oh, my goodness, please don't tell me this is true. And for the rest of the time, it was about one month that I was traveling and doing research in Thailand and Nepal, I kept finding that every single day I had children who were coming in to work for me, you know, whether it was, you know, underneath my table at a restaurant cleaning up my crumbs underneath and, you know, that's a three-year-old, um, you know, or whether it was walking by children who, like in this picture, I chose this picture because it was a, a child bricklayer, which I saw a lot of in um, in Nepal. And so it really um, it, it is a widespread problem that is largely driven by poverty. And right now we're seeing about 200 million children around the world who are engaged in child labor. And child labor is not, um, it's, a, it, it's not all children who work before they turn 18 years old. It is about work that is interfering with the child's school. It's work that's harmful to the child, that may be dangerous, that's exploitative because it's in, you know, the sex industry or that it's age appropriate. That, you know, you should not have, you know, a, a young child like this who's probably about four years old, you should not have him as a bricklayer. And so child labor doesn't mean all work that children might do because I actually delivered papers as a kid and I worked in a hamburger stand, you know, when I was like 13 years old. And I, I you know, it's like I support children working, learning to be responsible, developing, you know, responsible habits with re regard to diligence and stuff, but it's it's really the exploitative and dangerous work that children are being required to do in order for them and their families to survive that is included under the, the name child labor. And there are a couple of um, treaties that have really focused on child labor, and one is the International Labor or Organization's Minimum Age Convention Number 138, and that's where basically they try and establish that there are certain levels of age appropriateness for different types of jobs and try and outline uh, what those ages should be. And then the ILO worst forms of Child Labor Convention number 182 really focuses on exploitative or harmful language and tries to limit the type of work that, that children should be doing and not doing um, to make sure that this does not become damaging to them. Their working does not become damaging to them. But the important thing is, is for everybody to recognize that, as I'm sure, you know, this, this group does, that children's primary job during childhood should be learning and playing and that we need to support them in that and to the extent that non-exploitative work can supplement that or enhance that, you know, that that's fine, but it should not interfere with that and in no way should, should harm them. And then, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that right now I'm doing a lot of work with child sexual exploitation, and this is something that I became involved in just a couple of years ago where I was uh, asked to because of my legal expertise in international children's rights, I was asked to represent the Dutch National Rapporteur on human uh, trafficking and, the, and sexual violence against children in a U.S. Supreme Court case that involved the question of um, restitution to children for child pornography. And restitution is trying to make a victim whole for the damage that she's been suffered. And in that case, the uh, experts had determined that a child pornography victim, uh, at least the child pornography victim in that case, uh, had suffered an estimated $3.4 million in damages, almost $3.4 million in damages across her lifetime if you look at lost educational opportunities, work opportunities, et cetera. And up to that point, you know, I knew the general statistics about, you know, one in five girls are sexually abused and, you know, one in six boys. Um, but I didn't really have an understanding of the child pornography industry. And, uh, you know, basically what I learned during that representation is that this is a, a, a an industry and a practice that is growing at such a rapid rate and it's having a devastating impact on our kids and that almost nobody's tracking it. And so right now, some, you know, people, the lowest, estimates that I've seen are that, you know, well, actually, it's not the lowest, but, you know, 
some of the estimates that I've seen about how much money is involved here is $20 billion a year. And keep in mind that the overall adult pornography industry is $100 billion a year. So basically, you know, 20% of our um, pornography industry is sexually abused, uh, you know, the sexual abuse of children. Um, and I also started to understand that with advances in technology, with the Internet and the rise of, uh, you know, smartphones being commonly possessed by almost everybody, that there is this proliferation of images that nobody has a handle on, that nobody's controlling, and that my, uh, you know, some of the victims that I've talked to or corresponded with through their attorneys tell stories about people coming up to them at their job and saying, where do I know you from? You look so familiar. Or sitting next to them in college and saying, you know, um, don't don't we know each other from somewhere? And even men coming to their home and knocking on their door and saying, I saw what you did for your uncle. You seem to really enjoy that. I want to give you that pleasure. And so it's a quite horrifying experience because it's a, you know, tremendous violation of children's privacy rights at the deepest level at a point where they literally are, are being raped and it's been recorded and other people are deriving pleasure from their rape and that they know that their images are being traded all over the world and the impact that this child abuse is, is having both in the initial hands-on contact and in the hands-off contact it appears to be the same in studies that I've read from the Philippines and Europe and the United States and so high impact crime that can harm the child forever with regards to their brain development their you know the expression of their genes their mental health everything um, and yet, not nearly enough focus on it. And so although we've become aware of, of this problem um, ar around the world in the last 40 years and started to focus on it and try started to try and fight it in a way that we weren't doing 100 years ago, the fact is that it seems to be getting worse with the proliferation of child sex abuse images around the world. So um, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is covered by the second optional protocol that deals with uh, child sex trafficking, child prostitution, and, um, and child pornography. And so I'm trying to do a lot of work in that area. At this time, I'm going to um, open it up for questions. Hi, it's Anne Marie. Thank you so much, Professor Binford. This has been so informative um, for us. I just want to remind everyone that if they do have questions, you can type in your questions in the chat box. Um, I do have a few questions that we can start off with. Um, so first of all, Professor Binford, um, are there are there organizations or movements that are currently making a difference in um, in making positive change around children's rights around the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that so <clears throat> when I first got involved in children's rights, I pictured myself as you know going and working in on the front lines in developing countries or in, you know, war-torn countries. So I went to, like, the former Yugoslavia. And I um, and I, I thought that, that that's where my place was in the universe. And then when I went there, I discovered that I didn't really have the resilience to, to do that and, um, and that there were so many issues here in the United States that I decided to go back and, you know, come back to the United States and instead try and have an impact um, more with both individual children's um, rights issues, uh, you know, and advocating for their families and advocating for getting them out of foster care and stuff like that. And that the teachers who are on this call are absolutely making advancements with regard to children's rights, that by providing high quality education to these kids every day, every teacher who does that you know, to a group of students or just to one student every day is having an impact on, on children's rights. If you look at the, uh, you know, Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, I think that they have probably made a huge impact in the reduction, that 50% reduction in the child mortality rate that, that we're seeing because they decided, okay, where are we going to get the most bang for our buck? And so they just, you know, they developed these widespread immunization programs around the world where for $6, the child, and sometimes for 50 cents, depending on the immunization and where it is and everything, that a child could be immunized and significantly reduce that child's um, likelihood of developing a, a life-threatening disease. So, you know, whether you talk about individual teachers going into classrooms, whether you talk about, you know, 
the Red Cross workers who are on the front lines, which is what I intended to do, but then, you know, didn't have the resilience to do and start, step back and is now, I'm now trying to provide training for others, you know, for my law students and stuff, or whether you talk about the Phil and Melinda Gates. It's not just to save the children. It's not just UNICEF. It's not just the Red Cross that, that's making a difference. It's, it's all of us and everything that we do every day that we can impact children's rights. That's so important, and for many of us, the reason why we got into education. Um, thinking about teachers and their roles, oftentimes, uh, as teachers, we want to help our students to become interested as young people in fighting for or in advocating for rights for children. Um, are there any ways that you suggest for young people to become engaged in children's rights issues um, that teachers could help um, encourage? Well, I think that a lot of it is just educating our children to be in, engaged and well-informed um, citizens so that, you know, for example, I do volunteer work in my community here in Salem, Oregon, and so I teach as a volunteer teacher civics in one of the local schools. And so last night, you know, I took my kids to, my students to, um, you know, Bernie Sanders rally as part of their civics curriculum as a field trip. Last Friday we went to, a, you know, a Donald Trump rally. And in class we actually talk about kind of the rise of different rights in the United States and what rights they have and what rights they don't and what rights they think they should have. And it's really important for us, I think, to uh, carve out a place in our curriculum where we support the active engagement of, of children, um, preparing them for responsible citizenship, um, both, you know, in, in the United States um, as well as as part of the global community. Great. <laughs> Um, speaking of, I think, the global com community, um, oh, wait, I just asked another question, sorry. <laughs> um, Susan says, thanks for your remarkable and eye-opening talk, and that she's interested in your work in South Africa. Could you describe the rights landscape there for children? Yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, so um, I went to South Africa. Um, I So I, I grew up with these images of children in Africa scraping, you know, little meal, um, you know, porridge off the side of black cauldrons um, because they were starving with these suspended bellies. And because of that imagery in the 70s, I, n I never wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to go to, you know, all these different places in the world, take me to Switzerland or Sweden, you know, but never Africa. Um, and, you know, it, and I recognize Africa as a, you know, not a, um, it, it, not one country, but, you know, a continent. But even as a continent, you know, I, I had this aversion towards it. So, it. so a few years ago, I had been to every country in the world and every region in the world, except for, not every country in the world, but every region in the world, uh, except Africa and Antarctica. And I had been tracking the South African Constitution for years and was so excited about the wonderful work that was done in that constitution. I mean, this constitution was mind-blowing with regard to children's rights because, of course, you know, when Mandela and the other leaders of the new South Africa started to draft the interim constitution and the final constitution, it was around the same time that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child had, had been adopted. And so they used that as their model and in including robust children's rights right in the document. And so I thought, you know, I have this fascination with the South African Constitution and children's rights that are embodied there. So I really, and I, I've never been to the continent, and this is such an important place with regard to children's issues that I had this opportunity to go as a Fulbright scholar, and it was just amazing because on the one hand, I was able to go very deeply into the history of the constitutionalization of children's rights in Africa, and I just today um, published a law review article that's about um, 15,000, maybe 17,000 words on the rise of children's rights in Africa, and you are welcome to, to read that. It's on my um, on my webpage, my professional webpage. It's called the Constitution constitutionalization of children's rights in Africa. And it explores the history of the rise in children's rights in South Africa and then talks about how in, you know, the, the, the 20 now 20-something now years since that constitution has been adopted, that they've made progress in some areas, but they haven't made progress in other areas. So that, you know, for example, you do have more children who are being better educated in the urban areas, but you still see widespread problems with a lack of education support in the rural areas that many of the uh, member, many of the members of the population in South Africa have moved to the cities in order to work and send their children money back in the 
uh, rural areas, but the schools aren't really in place in the rural areas to really support them. So you do see tremendous global leadership from South Africa with regards to children's rights on paper, but you also see the remnants of apartheid in South Africa um, really holding children back and having, you know, enjoying the realization of their rights that were outlined in the Constitution. Okay. But I encourage you to, to, if you're interested in this, you know, my article is free. There's a link to it. Um, you know, there are hard copies available, but it's, you know, best for you to just access it online and, and print it or read it on the screen. But it, it outlines in detail the, the rise of children's rights in South Africa, and it is absolutely fascinating because they are the first country in the world to robustly recognize children's rights in, in the Constitution. So this question leads off of that. Um, you mentioned how uh, seeing imagery of child, uh, child rights abuses in Africa um, prior to going to the continent. And it made me think about, are there, you know, oftentimes media accounts in the United States tend to characterize child rights abuses as occurring in foreign places, even while we face challenges here in the U.S. Um, based on your work around the world, are there other common misperceptions that some Americans may have about global child rights issues? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that is very frustrating to me is, you know, having gone to both developing countries and developed countries and, you know, look, look, ha having had the opportunity to look at these issues on the ground, um, it, it really is very frustrating to come back to the United States and to see the level of, of just quite frankly, of arrogance about, you know, how perfect we are as a country and, you know, how great we are as a country. And it's like there are lots of things that I love about America and I am so grateful for the privilege and the education, the family that I had here, the stability of our country overall, you know, but there, are, uh, as you say, Marie, there is definitely a misperception that we are so much better than anywhere else in the world and that these are other people's problems, other countries' problems, and that simply is not true. There was a book that I just started reading um, on a trip last week, and I, I don't have it have it with me, but it's about the kids, and it's written by the former dean of the Harvard Kennedy School um, in public policy, and he talks about the level of inequality that our kids have started to experience in the last 20 years that is a... Um, you know, that is a greater level of inequality than anything that America has experienced in modern times and is, you know, and is unlike most other developed countries. And so you go into certain communities in the Rust Belt and everything, and over the last 20 years, we've seen a significant increase in child po poverty. We've seen a significant increase in wealth with regard to, you know, some people, and then a significant decrease in wealth with regard to many more people. And that there's got to be a way for us to resolve those conflicts because, um, you know, children do have rights to a certain amount of uh, protection and security in their lives and that they they do have a right to um, being with their family, being well-fed, being provided with, um, you know, a, a healthy environment and we're not providing that to them on nearly the widespread basis that I think that we think that we are. Great. I want to get to Tracy's question. Um, Tracy's seventh grade world geography class are beginning a study of South America, and they would like to evaluate an issue of children's rights um, in South America. Is there a focus country or case study recommendation that you might make? So in South America, so let's see. I mean, I really, the issues that, uh, you know, come to mind immediately in South America are, you know, violations of cultural rights of the indigenous people in uh, different South American countries. And so if I were designing a curriculum for middle school students, I would probably look very closely at that issue. Um, you know, so um, there is a lot of economic interest um, particularly in northern uh, South American countries, 
um, and also some southern Central American countries with regard to coffee and other plantations. And there is a, a certain level, level of oppression, cultural and economic oppression, that's happening with the indigenous groups where a lot of their, their cultures and their communities are dying out. And the other place that, you know what, and this might be even better, I would look at the rights of indigenous peoples in the Amazon rainforest. And you could look at this from two different perspectives. You could look at this both from a cultural perspective and, you know, children's cultural rights, as well as you could also look at this to children's rights to a healthy environment. And this would bring it home to your kids because, you know, the destruction of the rainforest um, is, is, you know, is having a worldwide impact. And so the kids would then have a direct relationship to, you know, here's something that we're seeing happening, largely driven by uh, economic interests that violates children's um, cultural rights as well as their environment, cultural rights there and env environmental rights of children elsewhere around the world. So I think that that would be my first choice is look at indigenous, start with, in, look, at, look at the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, um, particularly in Brazil, look at the indigenous kids and then look at it as far as, you know, does it have an impact on you and your rights as a child? Because one of the important things for kids to understand is governments don't give you rights, that rights are inherent, human rights are inherent to you, that all these treaties do is recognize rights that you already have. And so they should not think that because the U.S. has not ratified the U.N. Convention on the Rights of the Child that they don't have these rights. They absolutely have these rights. They're universally recognized by every other country in the world. And we know inherently that we have rights, um, you know, to, to these protections. And I think that primary source has put up some of the, um, you know, some of the materials regarding the U.N. Convention on the Rights of the Child, a simplified version of the convention that you can share with your kids. We, we did, and I'll share resources um, after one more question. And um, I just have to say, Tracy and I both agree that that's a great um, example for her class. And so that's um, an exciting thing to move forward with. Um, we have another question about, in the US, do you feel that, uh, do you feel in children's inequality is linked with economic inequality as well as historically with racism? And do you feel both are reflected globally so in the country? So the last lesson. The second to the last lesson that I did with my civic students who are, um, they are second semester, fourth grade students through eighth grade. And, um, and so what I did with my civic students is I used the iCivics, uh, curriculum that was developed by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And we went through the evolution of voting rights in the United States. And that lesson led us to a discussion about what the, um, legacy impacts are of slavery in the United States. And it was very easy for my civics kids at that age to see that if your grandparents are slaves and then they become, your parents are sharecroppers, you know, that you are less likely to have the money to pay the poll tax that, uh, you know, then prevents you from being able to vote and be an, an engaged citizen. And so in my kids' discussion of, of that lesson from iCivics, we were able to talk about the legacy economic and political implications of being a slave, um, you know, and, and the impact that that has in America. Um, I, in talking with adults, have frequently talked about the legacy impact of apartheid in South Africa. And if you look at uh, South Africa, which in fact is the country that is often ranked as having the highest level of inequality in the world, that it is the blacks who are um, the poorest and that the whites tend to be relatively wealthy. Um, and that the people who are colored, and by colored, that was how they classified people who were not black, they were not white, but they might be from Malaysia, from China, they might be Asian, they might be Indian, etc. But, you know, the colored people are kind of in the middle, and you see this as a, a legacy economic impact um, on, on these families and these populations. And so I absolutely believe that, uh, you know, economic successes and challenges today 
uh, are, are often a result of injustices that were committed generations ago. And that part of our challenge as a society is trying to figure out how to break that cycle. Okay. I lied about the last question because I want to get Emily's question in. And Emily's question is around how widespread is child labor in the garment industry? Particularly, are there any international laws that keep children out of factories or people from purchasing clothing produced by children? So, um, so the two ILO conventions that I mentioned are uh, intended to keep both young children out of factories and then children out of factories that are dangerous. You know, even uh, you know, even if the child is old enough to work, to try and um, you know, try and at least keep them out of dangerous factories. But the the truth is that despite these laws and the efforts that were being made, particularly in the 90s, to try and combat children child labor that child labor is still very widespread. Um, we talk a lot about child labor in the factories, but where we see most child workers working is actually in agriculture. And this is not something that's just happening in India and in Sub-Saharan Africa, that we see a lot of child labor, particularly with immigrant children or refugee children here in the United States. It is a way for people to keep keep down wages and to, um, you know, there, there are people, lots of people who benefit from cheap food, including us, um, but there are also lots of people in between who, who benefit from cheap food, and the cheapest labor is um, usually children. So we're seeing a lot of children in the agricultural industry and not just in the garment industry, and it's something that we need to do a better a job of. Specifically with regard to the garment industry, you know, we in the uh, late 1990s, um, there were a lot of people who were trying to rein in child labor, uh, particularly with regard to garments that were coming into to the U.S. And, and Europe, and it was decided not to go with the hammer, but instead to rely on industry to do the right thing and not to hire factories that engage child labor and um, to label clothing, to tell people that this is free of child labor. Um, and you know, and, and I, I think that that was probably very naive. And I think it was probably a very political resolution at that point in time. I don't think that it contributed to a reduction in a significant reduction in child labor. And I think that I know that we still have widespread problems. I mean, you saw you saw the numbers with uh, over 100 million children working in in dangerous child labor situations. So um, I think it's in, important for us to maybe revisit the issue and and try and figure out what's the best way to 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 combat child labor, but I, I honestly think that one of the best ways to combat child labor is to provide economic, to ensure and support economic stability for parents because we know that child labor is, is uh, almost always tied to family poverty. And so if we can do a better job of combating poverty on a global level, then there will be less children who need to go into uh, factories or fields and are less likely to be exploited. So I, I think that really the key here, the, one of the greatest challenges facing us in the 21st century is the elimination of global poverty and that so many other uh, issues will be eliminated if, if we do that. And I saw, Anne-Marie, that there was a question about female genital mutilation. Did you want to yes. talk about yeah, um, yes, if you want to take that question, um, we, um, yes, that's fine. So let's see. Uh, Susan was asking, how do you teach, talk about female genital mutilation? Uh, did the international convention sidestep the issue? And do you feel it should have been encompassed as a dimension of child rights? Um, so, so basically, this was, they tried to address this somewhat with coded language in the convention, um, but, you know, by talking about harm to children, um, but without going after any particular culture. So one of the goals of the people who are drafting the convention was to have universal, universal ratification. And in order to have universal ratification, you can't have cultural imperialism and, you know, the criticism of female genital mutilation by many in, in the West and in the North. Um, was characterized that way. So it wasn't specifically addressed, but it, you know, you know, harmful cultural practices is the code that's used to talk about it. And I think that this is a really, um, provocative topic for kids to talk about. And, um, you know, I, I think that I, I normally 
talk about it um, with my law students. Um, and I think that it's something that, that can be discussed probably with high school students. I probably wouldn't discuss it with kids who are younger than high school. Um, you know, but, you know, as far as, um, you know, do I think that it should be encompassed as a dimension of, of child rights? In my own development, I used to think that we needed to respect um, cultural practices within reason. So, you know, if they wanted to do a little, like, token nip, because we do, of course, um, you know, allow for penises uh, to, you know, to, to be nipped that, you know, I thought that we needed to be respectful of cultures. But over time, my view of that has changed when I've heard more and more stories from people who have undergone, um, you know, this, this cultural practice and have objected to it and talked about the horror that it, it's brought to their lives and the amount of pressure that's put on them. So this isn't really a matter of free choice, which is what I thought it was when I was in my 20s and, you know, and thought that this was really up to the children and their families. Um, you know, I think that if people want to change their, uh, you know, their genitals or any other part of their body um, within, you know, reason as an adult, you know, that's fine. Um, you know, but I think that we need to really respect the physical integrity of, uh, of, of children and, and let them make this choice for themselves as adults. And, and quite frankly, now what we know from the brain science is that the brain isn't fully developed into the 20s. And so it, it's probably not a decision that I would even, you know, want people to be making at 18, but, but probably later. Thank you so much, Professor Binford, for answering our questions. This is so informative and so helpful as we, you know, think about how to address these issues in our classrooms. And I just wanted to spend a couple minutes to just make you aware of some resources that we've put together here at Primary Source. Um, we've created a teaching resource guide for our Global Social Justice webinar series. The URL for all of the resources is at resourcesprimarysource.org, Global Social Justice. Um, you can see the link, the URL is in the chat box, and we'll also send it to you in our follow-up email if you registered uh, for the webinar. Um, the resource guide has three tabs for the separate webinars in the series, so one on climate justice, one on gender violence, and then this tab for gender for, for children's rights. And the guide for, for each section is divided into different sections that include book recommendations, curriculum, videos, and useful websites. So some examples of what you'll find is um, elementary friendly versions of the documents that Professor Bin Binford mentioned today, um, including the simplified version of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, this version outlines the various provisions in classroom friendly language and format. We've also included other options to introduce students to child rights, um, such as this UNICEF Australia cartoon, and this is great for elementary students. Um, we've compiled various lesson plans and curriculum units on children's rights from organizations such as Amnesty International or this set of lessons for elementary students from Oxfam. So I know there are a few questions about teaching child's rights for fifth graders. So, so this um, resource is for 8 to 11 year olds. We've also compiled, um, if you're looking for books to use with your students, You'll find an annotated list of selected sources, uh, such as a recent picture book about two young heroes of Pakistan, um, around rights for freedom and education, this new graphic novel for upper elementary, middle, and high school students about child soldiers, and the book It's Our World Too, chronicling stories of youth who are working on a range of social justice issues. So you'll see lots of uh, book recommendations. In addition to curricular materials, you'll find links to current data on children's rights. So this is the UNICEF's annual The State of the World's Children. Uh, this report summarizes children's issues around the world. And we've included access to data sets as well um, for, um, high, for high school. Um, you'll find links to, this is also from UNICEF's uh, The State of the World's Children report. Um, but there's also other charts and graphs and interactive data around exploring children's rights issues. You'll also find links to current news and advocacy stories, uh, such as this Human Rights Watch's section on children's rights that you and your students can use to learn more about specific campaigns or injustices. And then finally, if you're looking for more ideas on how to introduce school, uh, child rights across all grade levels and disciplines, take a look at the recent blog post that my colleague Susan Zeiger and I just wrote for the Asia Society's Global Learning Blog on EdWeek. 
we've outlined various resources and strategies that we think would work well to engage students of all ages with child rights. I'll put that link in the chat box as well to that site, but it's also on the resource guide. And again, so all of our teaching resources and more can be found on our Global Social Justice Resource Guide here. Um, as we conclude our program, I just wanted to remind you that there are many ways to continue to connect with global issues through Primary Source, through our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter, Pinterest, and our Teacher Digest. We have registration is still available for our summer institutes, so visit our website for more information. And I want to just extend a final thank you to uh, first to my colleague Susan Zeiger for co-leading this webinar series. Uh, the Cummings Foundation for partnering with Primary Source to support this global social justice webinar series. All of you for joining us on such a busy May afternoon, and especially our amazing guest today. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Warren Binford. Uh, it was just so um, really thought-provoking and so helpful for, as, for us to really think about these, this critical issue as we move forward with our students. Thank you so, to all of you. Thank you I so appreciated much. the opportunity. Okay, and at this point, this is the end of our webinar for tonight. As I mentioned, please do stay in contact with us, and we will be sending along a follow-up email with a link to this webinar, and then also a link to all of the resources that we brought up today. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We know it's a busy time of the year and a busy um, uh, time of the day as well for all of you. Thank you. So thank you.